We're here at Westminster College in the Church of St. Mary the Virgin Aldermanbury at America's National Churchill Museum. This wonderful sanctuary was relocated from London to Fulton in 1969 and dedicated as a memorial to Winston Churchill and his famous Iron Curtain speech, which he presented here at Westminster College. We are very delighted in anticipation of our 50th anniversary to present this short documentary by Steve Stinson, one of the original tour guides in 1969. His father, Dave Stinson, was the vice president at Westminster College, responsible for the administrative details of relocating and rebuilding Aldermanbury here in Fulton. We hope you enjoy this wonderful documentary with rarely before seen footage of Aldermanbury and its reconstruction here in Fulton. We hope to see you here soon. St. Mary the Virgin Alderman Barry was one of 53 churches, including St. Paul's, designed by Christopher Wren after the Great Fire of London in 1666. He was paid 21 pounds for the design. It took about four years to build. It was completed in 1678. It was the second St. Mary Alderman Barry. The first was built 900 years ago. It abutted the Roman wall that once protected the city. She was the victim of an incendiary bomb in World War II. This type of bomb detonates in the air and rains down fire. The next day, only the stones remained. The concept for a Churchill Memorial at Westminster was born in 1961. Westminster, the Iron Curtain Address, it was a natural match. Patrick Horsebrew, a native Scot who was a professor of architecture at the University of Nebraska, was, at that time, eager to save a Wren church. He drew this sketch. He negotiated with church and civic officials in London. St. Mary Aldermanbury had no post-war future. Her neighborhood, Cheapside, was no longer a residential district. Horsebrew and a team of architects picked her. She became a gift to Westminster from the Anglican Diocese of London. This was no bargain basement gift. St. Mary Aldermanbury is one of the finest examples of Wren. She would be taken apart and shipped across the Atlantic. She would be put back together at Westminster. Neil S. Wood of St. Louis was chosen by Westminster to head the committee that would carry out the project. Here he is with Robert Wright Stopford, then Lord Bishop of London. Dave Stinson, then Vice President at Westminster, moved his office to a house on West 7th Street near the site. It became headquarters for the project. The project would require $2 million, about $17 million in today's dollars. He would raise the money. The project was unique. He had to explain it, and he had to sell it. The pieces had to be in place, so to speak, before you could move the stones. Where to start? You don't just wake up one day and decide to move a pile of precious limestone across the Atlantic. Viewing the finished church as it stands today, it is difficult to measure the audacity of a small college in a small town undertaking the project. It was not a sure thing. Nobody wanted to be humiliated by a huge failure. Then, as the project was getting underway, serendipity struck. Dave Stinson was on a fundraising trip when he was approached on a Manhattan sidewalk by a recruiter for the game show, Password. Douglas Fairbanks Jr. was his partner on the show. They performed poorly, went on a Manhattan club crawl, and became friends for the years thereafter. Fairbanks, son of the legendary silent movie Swashbuckler, was a movie star in his own right. In real life, he was also a much decorated hero of World War II commando raids, serving in both the American and British military. Fairbanks quickly became an enthusiastic supporter. He opened doors in Hollywood and New York and London that changed the fundraising game for the project. Fairbanks continued to play an important role as an advisor and strategist and as a liaison with key figures on both sides of the Atlantic. He was visible at times, but mostly stayed in the background, an unsung hero for the project. Things began to move. In 1962, Winston Churchill endorsed the project. 
A year later, President John F. Kennedy was named honorary chairman of the project. Governor John Dalton of Missouri was named chairman. In 1964, the campaign chaired by magazine publisher Henry Luce, Ambassador Averill Harriman, and Charles Thomas of Monsanto raised $500,000 for the dismantling and removal of the stones. Soon after, Harry Truman broke ground for the project. At the same time, President Lyndon Johnson lent his name to an appeal for public support. Marshall Sisson, one of England's best-known architects, would work as a consultant with St. Louis architect Frederick Sternberg on the project. Here is Sisson at his home, standing between Dave Stinson and Neil Wood. Sisson's wife is at left. Dismantling of the church began in 1965. More than 650 tons of Portland limestone would cross the Atlantic after getting a good scrubbing. The original column bases were sandstone and couldn't be moved. The stones were numbered to follow drawings by Sisson. Shipping companies donated their services. Now, the fun could begin. The first stones arrived in 1966. That's the white campus of William Woods in the background of these images. Dave Stinson and Earl O'Rourke, then superintendent of buildings and grounds at Westminster, rode the rail cars with the stones on the final leg of the journey. O'Rourke's men unloaded the stones where railroad tracks crossed Westminster Avenue. The stones were trucked down to the site. Seven thousand stones. O'Rourke's men laid them out by number in rows, then cataloged them. Here's a Wren trademark, a stone pineapple. It signifies hospitality and fertility. Work on the foundation, the undercroft, and the bell tower had already begun. Here, workmen lay the base for the entrance staircase. The 12 Corinthian columns went up first. The man in the green hard hat is Renzo Palmer of Columbia. He was the site foreman and the last man to leave the site every day. I never saw him without a cigarette. bell tower rose. The first 24 steps were all that remained of the original 900-year-old belfry. They were all that survived the Great Fire. And then the walls began to rise. The numbered stones began to fit. Replacement stones and stone used for repairs were mined from the same quarry in Portland, England as the original stones. Here a repair job is underway. The 
east wall of the church contains original hand-carved stone. It took master stone masons to rebuild them. In 1967, the last stones were in place ahead of schedule. Work on the roof and interior could begin. Wren refrained from overcrowding his churches with pews. Here is a photo of the interior in the early 1900s after centuries of modifications, including stained glass, a lowered reredos, additional ceiling medallions, additional pews, and an organ on the first floor. The rebuilt church would return to Wren's original design. Wren considered the ideal dimensions of a church to be about 90 feet by 60 feet. This was based as much on acoustics as it was on visual proportion. Wren wanted every word to be heard in every pew and in the choir. St. Mary's interior is 74 by 54. Noel Mander of Mander Organ Works in London directed the building of the 38-rank Tracker Organ. Mander was an obvious choice for this role. He came from a family of organ builders. He became well known after World War II for his work rescuing damaged organs for the London Diocese. His crowning achievement was the rebuilding of the organ in St. Paul's Cathedral in 1977. St. Mary's organ was modeled after an earlier Mander organ in another rebuilt Wren church in London, St. Vedast. This photo of the St. Vedast organ was taken by Ann Stinson in 1966. Wren was famous for saying, nothing can add beauty to light. And here, light pours in on all sides and from above through clear, hand-blown glass, while the Reverend Dr. John Cowan then chairman of the Westminster Board of Trustees, reads scripture during the rehallowing ceremony before the memorial was dedicated. Another moment of serendipity. The vestry doors, including the columns above each door, are by Wren's chief woodcarver, Grinling Gibbons, whose shops created the original carvings for St. Mary. The vestry carvings were made available by another church. The carvings on the Reredos Baptismal and Balcony are by Arthur Ayers of London in the style of Gibbons. The Ten Commandments were lettered by Francis Stevens of London. The ancient silver communion plate is from the parish of St. Vedast. The altar table replicates the Wren era style found in St. Vedast. Marshal Sisson executed the understated Wren ceiling designs. Local and British craftsmen carried out the plastering. The chandeliers replicate Wren designs. The hand-blown glass was manufactured by the Blinko Glass Company in West Virginia. The five bells were cast by a Dutch foundry that had been in business since St. Mary Aldermanbury was built. One day, Dave Stinson opened a letter from Douglas Fairbanks. The message? Stop the search for a Churchill sculptor. He had found the artist. Franta Belsky was a Czech-born sculptor who served in the British military in World War II and had become a British citizen. He had also become a favorite of the royal family. His bronze of Churchill striding with his cane is the grace note that changed the church into the Churchill Memorial. And the note is pitch perfect. The statue is of the same relative human scale as Wren's design. Its placement, which Belsky doggedly insisted upon, extends the interior lines of the church outward and elegantly positions the bronze so that it does not interfere with the sight lines of the church. And then she was complete. She was 291 years old on the day she was reborn. Wren designed St. Mary Alderman Barry to command a corner. 
She still does. A half century ago, people and institutions known and unknown on both sides of the Atlantic answered the bell and made this remarkable story happen. The tradition of giving continues as the reach and influence of the memorial grows. The Undercroft houses a museum that now meets world-class standards. Every year, the National Churchill Museum attracts thousands from around the world. In 1990, Ronald Reagan dedicated the sculpture Breakthrough by Churchill's granddaughter Edwina Sands to commemorate the close of the Cold War. The cuts in this portion of the Berlin Wall celebrate the new communication between the East and West. In 2011, St. Louis sculptor Don Wiegand depicted the dramatic moment from which all else followed. The delivery of the still evocative line, an iron curtain, has descended upon the continent. Churchill's Sinews of Peace speech, popularly known as the Iron Curtain Address, gave birth to another tradition. Over the years, a number of world leaders, including Mikhail Gorbachev and Margaret Thatcher, have traveled to Fulton, Missouri to speak at the memorial. St. Mary Alderman Berry has stood at her new home for 50 years, and the acids of time have worked against her. Masonry repairs and other preservative work on the exterior and interior of the building are needed to ensure that the building continues as a showpiece for future generations. A campaign to raise funds necessary to preserve the church and complete the next phase in the generous adoption of this national landmark is underway. Contributions from Churchillians and others interested in this important work may be made directly to America's National Churchill Museum, online, in person, or by mail.